Happy Sabbath, friends. It's neat to see you here. <laughs> and uh, we know that there, there are some folks away and they're visiting with friends and family. And I think it's great to have holidays as such that we can uh, take a moment of reprieve and uh, not work, and relax, spend time, extra time with friends and family. But we're grateful that you made time that you could come out and to worship with us this morning. Thank you. I know there's a few extra visitors that trickled in the door since the announcements. I want to say welcome to you as well. I'm glad you're here. It's Easter weekend, and there's a lot of fuss uh, over this weekend in many different circles. We were talking about it in our youth Sabbath school this morning. And, um, you know, recently I've been challenged by uh, an individual that was complaining that, oh, the devil's taking over Easter, and all these eggs and bunnies and things. And uh, I've been kind of mulling over that thought for a little while. And uh, no, that's not the premise of my sermon, so don't worry. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I don't know if we should be as offended as such uh, that if we do see Easter eggs and bunnies around that this holiday, as we know, and you read your history books well, was was not a Christian holiday before Christians labeled it as such. And that's uh, not the point of my message today either, but I think it's neat to recognize that Easter has become ingrained in our societies, and it is a time where people are willing to recognize and willing to speak on terms of of God. Yeah, they may speak about Easter eggs as well, but they're more open um, a friend of mine just yesterday had mentioned that some Christians are C and E Christians. They're Christmas and Easter Christians. That's when they come to church. And uh, this may be a time that they're more open and perceptive to the gospel. And I think we should use this time to, uh, if they want to talk about Easter, tell them about our Lord. Tell them about how He is alive. And let's demonstrate it by the way we live. Amen? Amen. So, with saying that, I do not recognize as, and I cannot find any sanction in Scripture that Easter is a, is a holiday that God calls us to recognize, but because culture does, let's use this as an opportunity to speak to them of Jesus. Amen? Amen. So, on that note, I want to have a word of prayer, and we are going to quickly zoom through um, the Easter weekend through Scripture um, and what... Uh, the things that Jesus did for us. So let's just bow our heads for prayer one more time. Our Heavenly Father, thank you for bringing us here. And I pray that you may open our hearts, that we can uh, be more receptive to your word, that we may receive you into our life, that we can be better lights to shine in the world around us. And Lord, we do. We highlight and we are grateful for the sacrifice that you made for us. I pray that that may impact us again today. May you quicken our consciences, make us sensitive to the fact um, that we can be of, of a surrender to you more fully through this. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> Turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Matthew, chapter 26. We're just going to jump right in. We're going to hit a few points highlight a few points. I'm going to read a few passages. But Friday night, Jesus, he has the Last Supper with his disciples. He breaks bread with them. Judas departs and goes to betray his Lord and Master. And Jesus they, and his disciples, they sing a hymn and they head off to the Garden of Gethsemane for a night of agony and prayer. And as they head off to the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus takes a few of his disciples, they leave them at, uh, they take all of them, and they leave a portion of them at the gate of the entrance of the garden, and he takes some of his closest friends, Peter, James, and John, and they carry on a bit further. And in Matthew chapter 26 and verse 36, it says, And Jesus came to them to a place 
Then Jesus came with them to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to the disciples, sit here a while, I go and pray over there. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, and he began to be sorrowful and deeply distressed. And then he said to them, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful even to death. Stay here and watch with me. He says, I, not sad, I'm sorrowful. I'm, I feel like I'm dying here. And what's taking place at this moment is Jesus is beginning to feel the burdens of the sins of the entire world ever committed and ever to be committed. These are bearing down on his shoulders and he says, I'm dying. Now, how would you respond if a friend said to you, hey, I'm dying here? Usually we want to aid to their help, but the, the disciples didn't seem to recognize. They just saw oh, Jesus is going to go pray. But just imagine and just ponder on that thought for a moment of Jesus, the spotless Son of God, becoming the sin bearer. That's a pretty hard task, isn't it? And I don't know the last time when you faced a difficult situation or a difficult task, if there's any fathers in the room, when was the last time, maybe when your children were in nappies, you started to smell an aroma around, and you said, hey, honey, now did you ever do that? Did you call that attention and say, hey, uh, this one's for mom? You know, we're easy and we're prone to back out when we meet difficulty, when we meet uh, something that may be hard to accomplish. But Jesus here, he's not backing down, he's not giving in. But it says in verse 39, then he went a little further and he fell on his face and he prayed saying, oh my father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me, not as I will but as you will. Feeling the sin on his shoulders, feeling the darkness pressing in, feeling most clearly the separation between him and his heavenly father. He was feeling disconnected. Have you ever felt that way before? Disconnected from the father? You know, it's easy in these moments of feeling disconnected that we can get frustrated and we may not even want to talk of God or talk to God. But I think it's important to follow the example of Jesus here. This is how he's feeling in this moment. But he cries out to his heavenly Father and he tells him how he's feeling. He tells him what he's going through. And so when we're feeling happy, let's praise God. But when we're feeling the burden and the separation, we must not trust our feelings, but trust our Heavenly Father. We must call out to Him in prayer, as our Lord and Savior did. So three times He asked that God might remove that cup from Him, but He surrendered and said, God, I'm willing. This is the plan that has been set in motion since the foundation of the world. I'm willing to go through with it. Agony was striking our Savior, and the Bible tells us that he sweat drops of blood. And that is not something that's just unique to Scripture. Apparently, this is found in medical science, that when you're under extreme stress and extreme agony, that the pores in your, vest, in your skin will actually open up and blood will seep out. So this is uh, not something necessarily unique to Jesus, but it does highlight the fact of how stressed and how burdened He was in this moment. An angry mob comes. I said we're going to move fast. An angry mob comes, and we jump down to verse 57. It says, And those who had laid hold of Jesus led him away to Caiaphas, the high priest, where the scribes and the elders were assembled. But Peter followed from a distance to the high priest's courtyard, and he went in and sat with the servants to see the end. 
Now the chief priests and the elders and the council, they sought false testimony against Jesus to put him to death. It's interesting in the court systems today that someone may be completely guilty of a crime, but they have to have evidence to be sure that they can be found guilty. And yet here they're scratching for evidence, and there was no evidence to be found for Jesus to be proven guilty. He's the spotless son of God. So they start pulling the cheap shots, and they're calling in false witnesses. In verse 60 it says, But they found none, and even though many false witnesses came forward, they found none. But at last two false witnesses came forward and said, This fellow said, I'm able to destroy the temple of God and to build it in three days. They twisted his words, didn't they? The high priest arose and said to him, Do you answer nothing? What is this man testifies against you? But Jesus, he kept silent. It reminds me of the passage of Scripture in Isaiah 53, that he was like a sheep led before his shearers, and he kept silent. But finally, under oath, they call him to testify, Tell us if you are Christ, the Son of God. And Jesus says, It is as you said. Nevertheless, I say to you, Hereafter you will see the Son of Man sitting in the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. And you can almost hear the mocks and the jeerings in the crowd and the devilish grin over the Pharisee's face because now they have their, their accusation and it's sticking. This man claims to be the son of God. And they cry out in verse 65, then the high priest, they tore their clothes saying, he has spoken blasphemy. What further need do we have of witnesses? Look now, you have heard his blasphemy. Was it blasphemy? Was it wrong for Jesus to identify himself as the Son of God? No. No, it isn't. Would it be wrong for me to identify myself as God? 100%. I hope you'd stone me. (laughs) But Jesus, being God, was not wrong. But yet that is not what they wanted to hear or what they wanted to receive. And so they had their warrant to have him stoned, to have him killed, sorry. Verse 67, it says, Then they spat in his face, and they beat him. And others, they struck him with the palms of their hands, saying, Prophesy to us, Christ, who is the one who struck you? And you read through the different accounts of Matthew and Mark and Luke and John in this moment, that Jesus experiences a lot of abuse. And he's dragged from judgment hall to judgment hall. He's taken from the priests, taken into before Pilate and before Herod and back to Pilate. He was, a crown of thorns was placed upon his head. He was spat upon, he was beaten. He was whipped, not once, but two different times. He was scourged. His back would have been a, a blood, bloody, broken, bleeding mess. And later then he was nailed to a cross with nails piercing his, his hands and his feet. And as I think of this, it's quite a bloody image, isn't it? But if the Bible says and if the Bible is true, look with me in 1 John chapter 1. 1 John chapter 1 and verse 7. It says, But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. So even in this cruel and ugly mess, this blood that is being shed from his head to his toe... It gives me hope that the blood of Jesus Christ, it can cleanse us from all sin. If you go over to Ephesians chapter 1, it speaks of the blood there as well. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 7. Ephesians 1 and 
Ephesians 1 and verse 7, it says, In Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of His grace. Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane could have dusted off His hands and said, No, no, this is going to be hard. But rather, He rolled up His sleeves and He says, All right. Nevertheless, Heavenly Father, Your will, let it be done. And He went forward Blood dripping from his head. And it reminds me that Christ's blood, it covers the sins that we may commit in our mind. And as he was smote by those soldiers and he had broken face and blood dripping from his mouth and assuming black eyes as well, that it reminds me that Jesus' blood, it covers the sins that we say and the things that we choose to look at that we shouldn't look at, that his blood, it covers that. And the blood that was running from his hands and his feet of the things that we choose to do and the places where we choose to go that we should not go, his blood, it covers that. And it cleanses us from all sin. But the trick is, and the point is, in 1 Timothy, go to 1 Timothy chapter 4. First Timothy four in verse ten. First Timothy four ten reads, For to this end we both labor and suffer reproach, because we trust in the living God, who is the Savior of men, especially of those who believe. Jesus is the Savior of the world, of all men. But you have to believe. You have to believe that his blood, well, it does what he says it does. It covers your sin. It washes you clean. You have to believe that he is not just the savior of the world, but that he is your savior. They hung Jesus on that cruel and rugged cross. We jump back into the, into the narrative in Matthew chapter 27 now. And he's hanging on the cross. And in verse 42, the crowd begins to mock and to ridicule him. And they say he saved others. Himself, if he cannot save. If he is the king of Israel, let him now come down from the cross. And we will believe. They were mocking They were trying to make fun of him, that sure, he healed, and there was these little sleight of hand and miracles that he may have performed, but if he truly is the Son of God, let him come down off the cross. But Jesus here, he's making that choice. He could have, but he made the choice to stay there because he couldn't do both. He couldn't come down from the cross and you be saved. He had to stay there so that you could. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 22 says, Without the shedding of blood, there is no removal of sin. So Jesus chose. He says, yes, I will let my blood be shed. And he stayed on the cross, and he provided a method and a way and a path for the removal of our sin. And he had the promise in the back of his mind that in Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 2, it says that for the joy that was set before him, that he endured, his cro- endured the cross. Now that was written in hindsight after the cross had already taken place. But it's interesting in Matthew chapter 27, in verse 46, it says it was about the ninth hour. He'd been hanging on the cross for a while now. Broken, bleeding, his breath is becoming labored. It says, And Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama bath shalani, which means this, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus is in his darkest moment in earth's history. Yet the greatest 
and most brilliant thing is taking place right now. And he's feeling so separated from his heavenly father, and he cries out, why have you forsaken me, dad? Interesting passage, it's, uh, it's found in the book of Desire of Ages. It says this, Satan with his fierce temptation wrung the heart of Jesus. The Savior could not see through the portals of the tomb. In other words, when Jesus was hanging on that cross right there, and when he's crying out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He's feeling the guilt and the sin of all the world, the sins that have ever been committed and never will be committed. He thinks, I am too unclean, I am too covered in sin that my Father will ever accept me back. He has forsaken me. How could I, a sinful thing, ever again go back into heaven? In other words, Jesus Right here and right in this moment, he's dying the second death for you. Now, the first death, the Bible says, you can come back from that. But the second death, that's eternal separation from God. And there's no coming back from that. And Jesus is experiencing this in this moment. As dark and as ugly as this picture may be, bring to our minds it is shining forth beautiful hope because even in that moment he could have come down but he says no I'm willing to give up my place in heaven so that you could be there so that you could be there I have a hard time giving up my place in traffic and letting someone else in but Jesus was willing to even give his spot in heaven for you. We'll turn over into the narrative in the book of John now. And John sheds a little light here on the closing scenes of Christ's death. In John chapter 19. John chapter 19, and it says... In verse 30, it says, When Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, It is finished. And bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. He died. It is finished, or you might say it is complete. It's, it's done. Remember, he's not seeing past the portal of the tomb. He's only seeing, yes, the way has been made so that you can have a hope of heaven, have hope of eternal life, have hope of your sin being cleansed. And he hung his head and he died. Now jumping down to verse 38, it says, After this, Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, but secretly, I like how John notes that, that Joseph of Arimathea, he was a disciple of Jesus secretly. Now Jesus had many disciples. He had the close 12. We had the, the, the broader 70 also that were sent out on mission work. But there was also other believers in Christ that were secretly believing in Jesus and who he was, but didn't want to openly confess that. Now, it's interesting here in this moment and in this hour, when all the other disciples publicly confessed before that they were a follower of Jesus, they're nowhere to be found. They're hiding their heads under a rock, hoping that nobody will ever notice and attach them to Jesus. But Joseph of Arimathea, a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of Jews, asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus. And Pilate gave permission so that he came and he took the body of Jesus. It's almost as if he's regaining the time that he'd lost. He says he'd been tired of being plagued by following the views of what everybody else thought around him. He says, no, I'm going to stand up for Jesus now. And Joseph comes forward. 
and Nicodemus, it says, who at first came to Jesus by night, who also came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloe, about a hundred pounds of this stuff. It says, and they took the body of Jesus and they bound it in strips of linen and, they, and with spices, as the custom of the Jews is to bury. Now, in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden a new tomb in which one had not yet been laid. So there they laid Jesus because of the Jews' preparation day, for the tomb was nearby. So they take Jesus down off the cross and they wrap him and give them this special burial. And they put him in the grave and they go and they rest and keep the Sabbath. Even Jesus in his death, he rested on the Sabbath here. But then, early Sunday morning, and now I want to turn to the narrative in the book of Mark. Go with me to Mark chapter 16. Mark chapter 16. And it says in verse 1, Now when the Sabbath was passed, Mary... Magdalene, Mary, the mother of G James and Salome, brought spices. Sorry, they bought spices that they might come and anoint Jesus. And very early in the morning, on the first day of the week, they came to the tomb when the sun had risen. And they said among themselves, Who will roll away the stone from the door of the tomb for us? And when they had looked up, they saw that the stone had been rolled away, for it was very large. Now, it's interesting. Jesus had time and time again and said, listen, friends, I'm going to die. On the third day, I'm going to rise again. He plainly stated it as such. And yet, what were these women coming to the tomb for? Were they coming to say, all right, Jesus, time to wake up. It's, it's ready to go. No. What were they fully expecting to find in that tomb? A dead Savior. They're expecting to find a dead man. And I love how God blows our expectations out of this world. Amen? But they, in the humbleness of their heart... And in the simplicity of what they knew, they just wanted to come because they loved their Savior. They wanted to come to Him and see Him one last time. And they bought all these spices. <laughs> I hope they kept the receipt, right? They buy all this stuff, and they come to anoint their Savior, and the tomb's open. And it says in verse 5, and they entered the tomb, and they saw a young man clothed in long white robe. It's an angel. He's sitting on the right side. And they were alarmed. They were scared. That's not Jesus. And he said to them, Don't be afraid. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He is risen. He's not here. See the place where they've laid him. But go tell the disciples and Peter that he is going before you into Galilee, and there you will see him as he said to you. So they went out quickly and they fled from the tomb for the, they trembled and they were amazed and they said nothing to anyone for they were afraid. And they go back and they tell the disciples and they don't believe them. But Jesus reveals himself to the disciples over the next 40 days. Two on the road to Emmaus, there again in the upper room and in other places and finally where he ascended into heaven on top of that mountain. You know, I was marveling at this thought this morning. Is that there's been many people that have followed different faiths and different religious leaders throughout the centuries. There's people that follow Gandhi. There's people that have followed Muhammad. That have followed Buddha. And not to look down at these individuals for the faith that they've chosen. But these people that they've chosen to follow, they're dead. They're dead. But our Savior, Jesus Christ, 
His tomb is empty. He is alive. And there's so much that we could, could go into the nuts and the bolts about that of why would you use a woman in the Bible times to use them as a point of reference to prove your point? You don't. And that is the point. That this story is so unbelievable, it's believable. That his tomb is not, it's not still there. They made sure of it. They tried to keep him in it. They set a, a hedge of soldiers, a hundred soldiers around it. They bound it. They chained it shut. But that could not hold him. That couldn't keep him there. But he's alive. I was studying the Bible with a friend this week. And we've been studying for over a year together. And we've just, we were just worshiping God and just marveling at some of the promises in Scripture. And they began to recount to me over the last six months in their life of some difficult times that have taken place where they had experienced hardship. They realized that, hey, actually, where the place they, they were living, uh, they were selling, and they were going to have to move out and find another place to live. Now, in today's rental market, is it easy to just move from one rental unit into another? No, you're all shaking your heads. No, it's not. And this individual, she's a single woman, low income. It was a burden on her heart. And I tried to encourage her from time to time, and I said, let's pray. And she was actually doing quite well, and I could see she was clinging to God through this time of hardship and this transition. And there was nothing coming up, nothing coming up, but her faith, she kept clinging to God. God will provide. Until finally, it was like a rapid movement. She's like, I met someone. Hey, we're moving next week. And I was able to go there and help shift them into their new place. And just this week, we were marveling at that. That she'd had this road and looked back on her journey and she could see vividly and clearly how God's hand was actively involved in each of those stages in her life. And all I could say is, Praise God, our God is alive. He's there. You see it. I see it. He's there. Friends, are you like these women coming to the tomb on Sunday morning? You may have a burden in your life. You may have an experience. You may have a difficulty. You may have a situation looming ahead as it was for them. They, how are they going to remove this stone from the mouth of the tomb? But God had already provided a way. And we sit there and worry and wonder, how is this going to happen? And I know it's a lot easier to talk about this right now than it is to actually go through whatever you're going through right now. But I'm here to tell you that our Savior is alive. And that He's invested in you and that He loves you beyond all measure. And He knows what you're going through right now. And He sees the stones in your life. And he wants you to trust him. He wants you to hold on to him. And he, you don't know the way, but he will. He may roll the stone away. He may move the stone. He may throw the stone. He may cause you to walk right through that stone. But he will bring you through it. Because our Savior is not in the grave, friends. He's alive. He's alive. I serve a risen Savior, and He's in the world today, and I know that He is with me no matter what men may say. In closing, let's sing, He Lives.